Welcome to our show, Crooked Doctors. Um, as you uh, today, as you know, uh, today is Friday, uh, July. Uh, Friday, July eighth, and we have a live call-in show. Um, I have a guest with me today, Gilbert James. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure being here with you, Lydia, to work with you on your show. Thank you. Um, I should give you um, a little bit of background. Um, oh, in case you want to call us in and ask us a question, we're at... Oh, look, we have a, a question. Great. So, let's see. There you go. This is our caller. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hi, thanks for calling. Hello. Hello. Um, I just want to ask a question. Go hello. ahead. Hello. Um, hello. Hello, we're here. Oh, um, yes. Uh, what is this show about again? Go ahead, caller, ask your question. Okay. Go ahead. It's a, it's a, um, I'm sorry, I'm watching the, okay, I'm sorry, I'm watching the TV and the TV is going faster than you, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, okay the show, the what TV is the show off. about again? Pardon me? What is the show about again? Uh, Crooked Doctors, and we're talking about crime and corruption here in Manhattan uh, that started with my medical school, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva oh. University. Well, I think, I think crime is, is horrible. In Manhattan, Manhattan person, I think crime is horrible. It truly is. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this show, and I'm going to quote Mr. Vance, this is District Attorney Vance. Um, in the past week, he was uh, quoted in the newspaper as saying, quote, the cases you don't read about define what the job of a district attorney really is, end quote. Yeah. And I'm, exactly uh, I'm the case about. you didn't read about. So go ahead. Did you did you want to share a comment or a thought, caller? Um, I want to share a comment. Okay, go ahead. Um, my comment is, I believe that one day that the crime in Manhattan will go down because you know I live in a good part, but I also have to visit the bad parts of school, and so I know where like where like where things happen. Where do you go to school, caller? I go to a school called ASA. And what does ASA stand for? Do you know? Vocational training. Academy for Social Action. And how are you doing there? I'm doing very well in there. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, so I'm going to get back to, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us, caller? Um, no, that's about it. Well, thank you for calling, and we appreciate your thoughts, and good luck in school. Um, I think I, I say one more thing. Sure. Um, don't do it. <laughs> Please, why? I'll do it. All right, I'll see you later. Okay, thank you for calling. We appreciate your oh, call. Oh, no problem, no problem. Okay. Um, so, in any case, I had met Mr. Uh, Gilbert, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I had met Mr. James as a, as a producer here at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Do you want to... Yes, uh, I'm a producer here at uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and the way we met was sort of like spiritual because this studio is the studio I use for my TV program, which is Mind Science, Freedom for You. And I'm on every Thursday live at 4 o'clock, channel 57. That's Mind Science, Freedom for You every Thursday at 4 o'clock, channel 57. And we focus on helping people like you understand who you really, really are so that you can tap into your inner power and be all the good and the success and the prosperity you want to be. And so I was just looking in the studio and I saw Lydia and I said, oh, you know, I got to use the studio in a little while. And she was telling me about what she was doing and her, her work uh, challenging Yeshiva University, and I said, oh, by the way, that's my oh. alma mater. Oh, look, we got And that's how call. we met. Let's say hello, right here? Mm hmm Hello, thank you for calling in. Welcome to hello, our show. Hello, how are you? Uh, hanging in there, fighting the good fight. How are you? I'm fine. 
I wanted to comment on regarding the schools and as far as the crooked doctors. Um, I just feel we live in a society now where it's more easier to do evil than to do too good, and people are so busy worrying about losing their contacts and networking that they're thinking for the long run and, like, their contact versus, like, the right thing. I've been to several different schools, and one school in particular, um, Allen School, you know, like, there's a doctor there. His father is the father that was in um, Ellis Island. He's, like, a third generation of doctors. And while at school, I was um, threatened that my, um, the way, not from my, the way my, the way my work ethic was, but the way if I didn't really kiss up and, like, pooch up, I would be put in, like, some of the worst hospitals, not, like, one of the best ones. How, and how are you, just one second, how were you threatened at school? Excuse me? How were you threatened at school? How was I? I didn't hear what you said. Threatened. I think you said you, you were threatened at school. Yeah, like. Yeah, I was threatened, basically, like, if, basically, you know, they say you're no longer a civilian, and um, it's a certain what, what, way what that school people did you go to? communicate and act and go about things and literally try to discourage you if they see that you're more for your job than more for covering up things. A lot to do, it's an instance, certain things with paperwork, with billing. Call um, call call they, What school did you go to? I went to Allen School. I've been to Stanford Brown. Do you, are you familiar with mm -hmm. the school? What is the name of the school? Allen School. Allen School is, can you tell us a little bit about it? Allen School is a wonderful school. I believe they're housed in Brooklyn, and they have a lot of training on medical billing, uh, nurses' aid. It's been around for a long, long time, and they have a very good reputation. Um, so yeah, they, 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 let me tell you, they, as many students as they have, their graduation rate is not as good as they make it seem. And out of maybe a thousand students, maybe only about 10 or 11 is placed in appropriate places or let alone have all the, all the training that they need to go into an externship or internship and be hired. And there's a lot of things that a lot of these schools are offering that you are not properly equipped in to get an entry-level position. So it's like you're, you're taking out loans, you're going to school really for no reason. And if that's true, I didn't know anything about that. Well, um, well you do now. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you and for calling. I, I have an issue with, uh, with my school, Yeshiva University, and I have an issue about uh, federal student loan fraud. And when I talk about this publicly, I do have people coming up to me saying, hey, you know, uh, there was one woman when I went to Mr. The, dis the new district attorney, Mr. Vance's first public town hall meeting in Washington Heights. And when I spoke about Yeshiva University and federal student loan fraud, after I talked, um, and this is up on YouTube, um, a woman approached me and said she had been fighting Sally Mae for four years with federal student loan fraud. So, um, but the reason why um, Mr. Um, Mr. James or Gilbert, I'll call you Gilbert, mm -hmm. the reason why um, Gilbert is uh, with me today is because we felt there was an element of mysticism that sort of brought us together. Uh, exactly. Um, because uh, we're, he's a graduate of Yeshiva University. I went to Yeshiva University's medical school, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And um, Mr. Yeah. Gilbert was um, was a, is a graduate of their social work school. Yeah, I went to Yeshiva University to study social work, and uh, I graduated and got my master's degree from Yeshiva University, Wurzweiler School of Social Work. And I did get my master's degree, and I think one of the unique points about it is what Lydia grabbed a hold of, is that when I went to the school, they asked me, to get into the school, am I willing to take some Jewish courses? Let me say that again. They asked me, am I willing to take some Jewish courses? And so I said, yeah. You know, I didn't have a problem with that because I wanted the degree in social work in the, in the field that I wanted to work in. So, so I didn't have a problem with, so with there being that little religious pitch there. Well, see, my issue with the school is, and I needed to check this because I was litigating, I'm still litigating against the school. You got your degree from Yeshiva University. Mm -hmm. So Yeshiva University is the mother, the umbrella organization. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to check by attorneys, you know, to 
check in Albany where you get your degree. Now, the way the school is set up by charter in Albany, you've got your degrees from Yeshiva University. It's sort of an umbrella, you know, the mother university. Right, The right. social work school is a constituent. Right. And the medical school is also a constituent. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was interviewing for the Albert Einstein College of mm -hmm. Medicine of Yeshiva mm -hmm. University, mm -hmm. they did not tell me that they were a religious school an Orthodox Jewish school. They told me that they were non-denominational, and even today they advertise themselves as non-sectarian. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have a problem with that. I, had, I was an honors graduate of Columbia University. Um, I got my degree in 1994. Um, it was a Bachelor of Science degree, and I had offers to go to three medical schools. So I was not hard up for a medical school to go to. In fact, I was even accepted by a state school and I could have got, gotten a medical education cheaper. Um, and uh, in, uh, in subsequent shows, I'll, or I could do it now, one of the reasons why I was willing to spend more money to go to a private school was uh, one of my friends had um, been at the school, and she was also accepted to a state school. And her parents uh, were willing to pay for her education, and they said, if you go to medical school, at a state school, we'll pay for everything, you will not go into debt. But, but the you, thing about, I don't mean to cut you off, Lydia, sure. there is a religious component to Yeshiva University because w without me knowing, when I, and I'm not saying against that school, that's my alma mater. Right. When I went to go to the library on a Friday, I was told there's no library on a Friday because we're a Jewish school. Because on Fridays, the Jewish religion, they don't have any work, they don't do anything, but go home and prepare for the Sabbath their family gathering and prayer over the food on the weekends and things like that. So there is a religious component about that. You can't uh, go, to, go to the library or do anything like so that. So on, on, on the Sabbath, on, on the Orthodox Sabbath. Jewish Sabbath, the gym is closed, mm -hmm. uh, tutoring <laughs> services are closed, the library is mm -hmm. closed, there are religious rules, mm -hmm. um, and they let you know this in the interview process. Yeah, so, they, they let me know that I had to take courses, but I, I didn't know that I couldn't go to the library, <laughs> that, yeah. you know, because of the religious restriction there. Right. And, you know, it's funny because when I was a student there and we're all sitting around the, the, the table once in the, in the cafeteria, some of the Asian students were not informed either. And again, we didn't care whether uh, Yeshiva University was an Orthodox Jewish school mm -hmm. or not. What we cared about was would they be honest with us in the, uh, uh, in the interview process. And they were honest with you, but they were not honest with us. Mm -hmm. So the Asian student club would say things like, well, you know, we'd like to have our traditional meals. We, you, know, uh, you know, the Asian students would get together and they'd like to have, you know, pork meals. But you can't do that in an Orthodox Jewish school because there are religious rules. Mm -hmm. So um, you went to the social work school. What was the name of it? I went to Yeshiva University's uh, Wurzweiler, Wurzweiler School of Social Work. And, and that's a, that was a constituent school. Yeah, that's a constituent. That's, that's sort of like a satellite school under the umbrella of Yeshiva University. There's the law school, there's the medical school, there's the social work school, and there may be one or two other schools connected to Yeshiva University. And uh, it's interesting that when you were interviewing, they said, you know, please be aware that when you come here, we're a religious institution, contrary to how they advertise publicly as being non-denominational, mm -hmm. um, and that if you come here, you would be required to take religious classes, and you were unaware, as we were all unaware, that there were also uh, religious rules. So, um, you know, with respect, they were imposing an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle on you. But let me, let me just say, they didn't tell me about religion. They just said Jewish. Uh -huh. you, are you willing to take Jewish courses? Well, let me ask you something. If you were interviewing a Catholic university, for example, and you wanted to, um, you know, get your degree from Catholic university in social work, would they also ask you? Or? Let's say... Um, are you willing Fordham to, University. Yeah. Would you, would, did the, I don't think they would ask me what I want to learn about Catholic history. No, I don't think they would ask me that. But did you learn about Jewish history? Oh, yeah, in, I did. I did learn. Yeshiva? Uh, yeah, at Yeshiva, I did learn about the, um, the various uh, components of the Jewish clan. Uh, I, I, I'm not mean it, saying that in a derogatory manner, but under Jewishism, there's uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi, yeah. There's Reformed Jews. There's Orthodox Jews. There's Buharian Jews. You know, there's all kinds of different Jews. It's not just everybody you see that wear yarmulke is a Jew. You got to understand what Jewish part are they part of. 
and don't click with one another. Some people, for example, some Jewish groups, the Orthodox Jews, they don't believe in any attack against Palestine where the Zionist Jews believe in attacking, attacking Palestine. And you'll see some Orthodox Jews with buttons saying, hey, we are all for Palestine having their own state. We're for Palestine. But then you'll get another component of the Jewish uh, group saying they're against that. So, but it was interesting to know. I also learned about some of the Jewish ghettos, some of the Jewish hoods. They had some hoods in England where uh, the Jewish people come from in, um, in Europe. And I learned how some of their neighborhoods were very, very poor, and they had little food. Uh, of course, we know that they were hassled by the Germans. And so I had to so, learn that you so, know, in order to graduate. So you were required to take religious courses, and you were told in your interview process that if you come to Yeshiva University, you will be required to take uh, I had to take, classes. Yeah, I had to take Jewish classes in um, order to graduate. Yeah. And, but you were unaware that an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle would be imposed on right, you. Right, I, I wasn't aware of that. Okay, did that interfere with your educational, I mean, not going to the library from Friday night? Well, Friday would have been nice to go to the <laughs> library on a Friday night and do your work, but when I t was told that I couldn't, it, 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 I had a little shock for a moment, but that was it because, I, you know, see, my motivation Mm -hmm. was to get my degree in social work. So I didn't care if it was closed on Sunday or Monday. I didn't care. As long as it was open sometimes right. so I could get the learning and the guidance and the, and the knowledge about social work that I needed to get my degree and get a job. So overall, you were satisfied with your Yeah, job. I didn't have no problem. Uh, I enjoyed the fact that every, um, every teacher, every single teacher had a doctorate degree in something whether this was English, math, or whatever. Oh, yeah, I mean, our, our, our complaints about the school wasn't that you wouldn't get a fine education. Our complaint was you're advertising as non-sectarian, non-denominational, and you're not. So, for example, I didn't fit. I was older. Um, uh, you know, they like to see, Orthodox Jews, uh, Jews like to see women married with children because that's their, you know, accepted female role. That was not how I was living my life. So the fact that I merely existed, they would take as a, a challenge and affront. And you know, I, that's not what I was there for. Had you simply been honest with me and said, we're an Orthodox Jewish school, I would have been, thank you so much for right, the interview. Exactly, exactly. I got a state school to go to. Right. I can save money. Right. I got another private school in Albany. Right, right. And when, you know, and I, uh, ultimately what happened to me was I was used as a token in the admissions process mm. to demonstrate diversity, yeah. um, and I was railroaded wrote it out of school and mm. they denied me um, all the things that I needed to have success and mm. that you know I couldn't get federal work study money they made up a lie about that uh, they admitted that I did excellent work and that I was on track to publish original clinical research but they wouldn't let me um, uh, they wouldn't f they promised me in the recruitment process oh lie number two they promised me when they recruited me as a student that they would support student research a hundred percent that's not true um, so that's fraud um, and so again, uh, I found it very interesting that God had sort of brought us together mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in this, and said, uh, well, you know, they told you. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that if you were, and you know, maybe we should reach out to Roman Catholic schools and say, if you were at Fordham or if you were in Washington at Catholic University, if you were interviewing to go to our social work school, would we say you have to take classes in Catholic history? Um, I don't think that they would do that. <laughs> and, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, or if you come here, you're going to have mm -hmm. a Roman Catholic lifestyle mm -hmm. imposed on you. Mm -hmm. So on Friday is we don't serve fish. Not that we do that anywhere, but you understand. Right. Right. Um, what, what's interesting is that you provide another data point because um, when I started talking about this openly, I was called anti-Semitic. Now, mm. I'm not anti-Semitic. I can demonstrate that I'm not. Because uh, ultimately, when, even when I was illegally expelled from Yeshiva University, I was hired by a Fortune 300 company to work on their campus, and I did work successfully on their campus. I was doing business deals with Rabbi Dean Michael Hecht, um, hiring students, working with uh, Dean Pearl Berger. Mm -hmm. I was running programs in the main library. I rented classrooms, hired students, gave out scholarship programs. So I wasn't anti-Semitic, and I was professional enough to know that, you know, uh, to treat my professional work life different than my private dispute, dispute with the school. So well, let I, me ask you, uh, do you have an actual lawsuit against the yes. university? Yes, I do. Tell us a little bit about that. Lydia. Well, I'm going to get into that in a minute because right now what I'm doing is uh, I'm fighting an appeal and I was illegally convicted. 
and I illegally served uh, 11 months at Rikers Island because um, the school pressed false criminal charges against me. Did you did you commit a crime? Or? No, my only the only thing I did was uh, I asked for my records from Yeshiva University, mm -hmm. and they in uh, in violation of federal law refused to give me my records. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got you know, fabricated, made-up rulings by a federal court judge. That would be Judge Robert P. Patterson, Jr. Mm. Um, he, he, for example, claimed that I, as a form, uh, he claimed that I could not point to a school policy that would give me the right as a former student to access and correct my records. Well, that's just not true. Doesn't make sense. The Freedom of Information Act allows you to get the information that you want. Thank you so much, because when I appealed my case to the Second Circuit, I said, first of all, I don't need to point to a school policy. I have federal law, and, in the, and that would be the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is FERPA, and explicitly in the Code of Federal Regulations, a student is defined as anyone who is or has been in attendance at an educational institution. So I, I, as a former student, do have the right to access and correct my records under federal law, but the school policy is point number two, is to cite to FERPA. So on page 22 of my college bulletin, and this is on our YouTube videos, on, on, I made YouTube videos, uh, Crooked Doctors. If you go to YouTube and you type in under username uh, Crooked Doctors, you'll see me holding up my college bulletin from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. My belongings are in a safe place, so I have to go and get them, but I'm going to go get them and, um, and sh uh, show this on my show. But you also see them uh, on YouTube videos. I hold up my original college bulletins. Uh, from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University, and page 22 explicitly says school policy is FERPA or federal law. So twice the school has said our policy is federal law, and federal law says that I have the right to fully access and correct my records. So when I um, attempted to do that, and I was under a lot of pressure because I was being asked to pay for classes I never took, so I was getting threatening letters from the federal government that said, hey, if you don't pay for these classes, you know, we are going to experience all this economic harm and we're going to continue to impose harm on you. And I said, I'm not going to pay for something I never got. A lot of these issues were coming out in the landlord-tenant case that I was going through in New Jersey because I was trying to explain to my landlord, listen, I'd like to move, but my school has illegally declared me in default on a federal student loan I wasn't eligible to receive, and now when I go and try to get an apartment or a job, I have the black mark of a defaulted student loan. So that's when I got into, I have to call the school, I need my records, I need to access and correct my records, and school officials claimed they were annoyed. Well, where are you, as far as the process is concerned, where are you in progress? Where are you with that? With that? Well, right now, um, I'm uh, appealing my case, my criminal uh, conviction from Judge Edward J. McLaughlin, um, and uh, I was, as I said, illegally convicted and illegally served 11 months at Rikers Island. Mm, that's rough. You know, what's really, really frightening to me is um, it's bad enough that you would have crooked doctors, crooked lawyers, crooked police, and crooked judges, but when I got to Rikers Island, I literally wallpapered, I, I wallpapered the place with um, hard evidence that showed that I was illegally convicted and corrections officers, doctors um, uh, 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 had hard evidence in their hands and I'm thinking, you know, um, if what the audience needs to know is if you're innocent and illegally convicted and you're in Rikers Island for almost a year and you're putting this information into the hands of authorities, not one person said, oh my goodness, you don't deserve to be here. We better make a phone not call. Not one person said that? No, not one person. Um, uh, I was, uh, inmates were looking at my, and my uh, criminal trial transcript with me. My, my mother had come and had given me documentary evidence. I, I went uh, to Lisa Cherloff, for example. Lisa Cherloff is a supervising doctor there. Mm -hmm. And I would present and to, to, to doctors, to corrections officers. I even had my attorney call the warden. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she does not deserve to be there. So what's frightening is 
Um, when you have so much crime and corruption that you're illegally incarcerated in prison for 11 months and the hard evidence is there, it's not that people didn't pay attention. You know, I'm putting this evidence in their hands and explaining it to them. They actively denied reality to such an extreme that they show that it irrefutably they are co-conspirators. Uh, why, why do you think, Lydia, they would respond or react that way to, your, to the truth that you had? You know, that's a good question. I'd like to know. Um, Did that, you, were you given a lawyer, a legal aid, or somebody to help you with your case? Um, originally, I had, uh, and this is an, these are appealable issues, um, I had a uh, state-appointed public defender, mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we were joking about this at Riker, Rikers Island, me and the other inmates, and we were saying things like, the job of your public defender, see, you don't really have a public defender, you have a public pretender. <laughs> <laughs> and what he does is he pretends. Public pretender. You, yeah, you don't have public defenders. You have public pretenders because they pretend to defend you when in fact they work hand in glove with the district or uh, district attorney's office to convict you. And what's really going on is that Rikers Island is a great big business. That's now, what do you need to win? Uh, as much publicity as I can get, because when when the general public looks at the facts and and they look at the law. Um, it's irrefutable that what, what happened to me was a gross injustice. Um, the school is filled with crooked doctors. Have you talked to Al Sharpton? Ah, this is great. I'm glad you brought up Al Sharpton. I'd like to talk to Al Sharpton if he's great to be as a guest on the show. Um, I'm actually, um, thank you so much for asking. Um, I'm actually, um, I, didn't, I didn't set this up, he just asked. Um, I'm a member of Reverend Al, Al Sharpton's National Action Network. And before I get into bashing yeshiva and the, the, the criminal justice system and all that, I want to say something positive, because I was thinking about this. The positive thing I want to say is that um, Reverend Al Sharpton early in the Obama administration was summoned to the White House and he was given a mandate and his mandate was I want to see uh, from this is from the President of the United States of America I would like to see positive progressive change in the field of education so Reverend Sharpton comes back from the White House and he tells us the membership and I thought you know I can get that um, and I did um, the United States Air Force Academy pre-med advisor sends, I had friends in the military who helped me, um, and, um, and, and I'll get into that in a minute, but um, in fact, uh, one of my classmates is a guy named uh, Kevin Riley, uh, Colonel Kevin Riley, and he, um, I went to visit him at Fort Knox, and he um, authenticated, validated my original college bulletins in page 22, and he said, yes, you know, um, the college policy is to point to federal law, and you do have the right to access and correct your records. So thank you, Kevin Riley. Well, I mentioned Al Sharpton because, you know, he's been a consistent advocate for people who are struggling against crooked and corruption in the city and the state and the federal government. So, you know, I, I think you need to touch base with him, or, you know, and ask him and, and ask them, can they take this on as a case? Yeah, to help you. yeah, I actually uh, will. And one of the nice things about uh, Reverend Sharpton is when I started speaking out against Yeshiva and I was called an anti-Semite, he stood up and said, you know, he put he put this out there and said, well, when I criticize this, you know, Jews, I'm called an anti-Semite <laughs> and I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, since I'm a member of Reverend Af uh, Shockton's National Action Network, and we do work for positive progressive mm -hmm. change, um, I reached out to the United States uh, Air Force Academy mm -hmm. in Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. and I spoke with the pre-med advisor there, wonderful person. Um, they send about 18 students a year to medical school, mm -hmm. and I said, you know something? These are our future leaders. Mm -hmm. And what they promised me was, and I said, you know, sometime, these are our future leaders, and sometime, you know, Five years out, ten years out, fifteen years out, one of these, uh, you know, outstanding young men or you know, men and women are going to start telling truth to power. Mm -hmm. And what could happen to them is what happened to me. Once you start telling truth to power, mm -hmm. your medical school um, could start lying about you the way Shiva University's medical school lied about me. Well, what I can do so on wait, wait. my let me let me just okay. finish because this is important. So what I asked was for her cooperation, would you start to educate your cadets about how to independently archive your letters of recommendation and your performance evaluations so that these young men and women can learn how to protect themselves? You'll give them body armor to protect themselves. Will you give them information 
so that when they're, you know, they'll graduate from school when they're in their training when they're in their 20s, when then they're in their 30s, when they're in their 40s, when they're in their 50s, and when they're in their, in their 60s, and they start speaking truth to, to power, uh, never again will a medical school do to one of those people what happened to me, which is the Albert Einstein College of Medicine lied about me. They, they still won't release my letters of recommendation. They, they still won't, um, my, my performance evaluations, if I didn't have them, they would lie about, which is part of um, why this uh, illegal um, um, criminal charges were pressed against me, these, these uh, fa you know, false criminal charges. Um, which I'll get to in a minute, but the uh, on the United States Air Force Academy campus, mm -hmm. the pre-med advisor promised to start educating those cadets. And it's pretty simple now, you know, to start independently archiving your letters of recommendation and your performance evaluations. Had I taken that prudent step, had anyone done what I've what I'm doing now, and th there's a history at Yeshiva University of students who had been wrong. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I, they're always sending me letters from the university about coming to the alumni meeting. Oh, yes. And this time when I get a letter, I'm going to say, I'm not coming until you release Lydia's <laughs> transcript to her. Well, it's not my transcripts. So that's, that's, but... You know, whatever information you need. Yeah. Uh, and then I will also send an email to his uh, executive Al Sharpton, executive public relations person, Nora Linger, uh, and ask her to take a look at your situation. And what Thank else can you. I do? I also can mention your struggle on my program, Mind Science Freedom for You, every Thursday at 4 o'clock, Channel 57. And um, Listen, let me ask you something, because when, um, when I talk to the Equal Justice Committee at Reverend Sharpton's, um, uh, wait, let, me, let me just go back a minute. So. We have right now positive progressive change on the United States Air Force Academy campus. So, of course, the next step is to go to all the other service academies. No, the next step is get yours straight now. Yes, but I can build on this. So I have, um, I have contacts in the military. So, of course, I'm going to be reaching out to them and saying, look, if the United States Air Force Academy campus will lead the way. Then you get a synergistic power. Right. So I'd like to affair. see this at West Point And the, 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 I can't wait to call up Brigadier General Patrick Finnegan, who hates me. Um, and the and the uh, and the and the Naval Academy mm. and say, look, if the Air Force is leading the way, mm. let's build on that positive progressive change. Now, remember, wait, wait, wait. This comes from this mm. is a mandate from the the President of the United States of America, and Reverend Sharpton carried the message back to his membership, and we got that. You know, it seemed like it's so fundamental, so basic. You have your information out there in the university. You want copies of it. Give me the copies. What's the you, you know why? Because uh, if because once they start giving me my records, which mm -hmm. by the way are my property, mm -hmm. um, this is not their property. I paid the fees that mm -hmm. caused these records to be created and maintained. Mm -hmm. This is as as a uh, as a Supreme Court issue. This is my property. Mm -hmm. I have the right to fully access my property. Right. Um, just like if you were to go to a doctor, and you ask for your medical records. Mm -hmm. Your medical records are property that belongs to you because you paid the fees to that doctor right. to have those uh, records created and maintained. Right. So you know what would really help? I don't know if I'm going to be a little pushy here, but when I went to Reverend Sharpton and I went to the Equal Justice Committee, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, they referred me to Amsterdam News. Oh, yeah, Amsterdam News. Uh, the publisher. They're sort of like friends of mine, Eleanor Tatum. She just had a baby, right? Not, not too long ago. I uh, just sent her about maybe a month ago a uh, letter uh -huh. because I have an article that I wanted published in the Amsterdam News. Okay. And it talked about self-responsibility and having a positive self-image of yourself. And I sent the letter to her and I explained to her what this is all about. And the next thing I know, she had to publish in the newspaper. Great. So, if so, and so she's sensitive to these kinds of things where people are not being treated right. And you know, th this is in our neighborhood. So I mean, Yeshiva University is in Washington Heights, mm -hmm. it is in Harlem. Um, I lived at uh, 651, I lived at, uh, in, uh, in West 188th Street and Broadway. Um, I have to fight to get my home back. Um, fortunately, I had the support of my city councilman, City Councilman Rodriguez, um, and uh, I should mention uh, City Councilman Robert Jackson has offered assistance. Uh, f you know, thank you. You should also talk to uh, Assemblyman uh, Denny Farrell. Uh, we'll try to talk to him too. I um, spoke to his office today and developed a nice relationship 
okay. which is community liaison and person. And, uh, you know, the disheartening thing is uh, Detective Cologne is at the 34th Precinct, and he made false statements on the witness stand that we, were used to illegally convict and incarcerate me. So, I mean, this is in our neighborhood. This is, this is not, you know, uh, some abstract issue far away in Washington. Th this is the crime and corruption and the, and the criminals in our neighborhood. And I want to say something about Detective Cologne. Um, Detective Cologne started out trying to tell the truth because I saw the report that he sent to the prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. And he said, victim, meaning me, mm -hmm. uh, is reporting federal student loan fraud. And then a year later at trial, he got turned. Mm -hmm. um, so if I, and you know, I reached out to Detective Cologne. I'm like, look, if you were threatened, mm -hmm. we will protect you. If you were bribed or anything else mm -hmm. corrupt went on, then we do not protect you. But, you know, come, I'm going to give you the benefit of every doubt. Mm -hmm. Suck it up now, grab your boss, we'll go in front of Judge McLaughlin, and you're mm -hmm. going to tell him what you did. Because I'm, I'm going to out you on public access TV um, and talk about the false statements of material fact that you made. And ultimately, in his testimony, which is just a few pages, and I'm going to put it up there on a, uh, I'm going to create a blogger site called uh, Crooked Doctors Blogger, so you can look these, you know, I think it's 13 pages. I only need like three or four um, excerpts from a few pages. Mm -hmm. uh, but he even contradicts himself, and he says, yes, you know, he acknowledges and the judge acknowledges, yes, Lydia Radin's complaints came first. They were for fraud, not for aggravated harassment. She had no retaliatory motive. Ultimately, the school stipulated they confessed to fraud in federal student loan programs. And uh, the reason nobody wanted to do anything was because for fraud, the school, Yeshiva University, will lose its ability to administer these programs forever. Now, let me ask you, Lydia, what can the people who are watching your program this evening, what can they do to support you or to help you in your cause. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Vance promised me, this is for a second time now, Mr. Vance promised me that he would have a sit-down meeting with me, my attorneys, and civic leaders. So as soon as my attorney gets up to speed, he was trapped in litigation hell for a little while, um, but as soon as he gets up to speed, I want that sit-down meeting. And I would like community leaders such as yourself to sit um, in that meeting as uh, neutral objective observers and Mr. Vance has an opportunity now to restore you know I don't think the district attorney's office has credibility and integrity of not from my point of view but um, Mr. Vance has an opportunity now to um, you know fire people set new standards and really um, make the the Manhattan district attorney's office uh, what he purports it to be um, which is, uh, you know, the premier district attorney's office leading the way in Manhattan. The only thing I see them leading towards is crime <laughs> and corruption. Um, and, you know, but um, from, well, from... So tell the people, what, 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 what do you want them to do to help you? Um, I'd like them to, to call Mr. Vance um, and say, you know, uh, we have a major university, Yeshiva University, their medical school. If you can't trust your doctor, I mean, who can you trust? It's... it's uh, I've got uh, doctors, lawyers, judges, um, I, 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 uh, uh, police detectives who are lying. It's, it's outrageous. Um, and some of the issues that I see are, um, uh, you know, Yeshiva University is a large private school. Mm -hmm. They pretend to be non-denominational. They're not. I, you know, and they've got a choice now. They can either, um, the reason why they lie about being mm -hmm. non-denominational mm -hmm. is because they want public money. So they have a choice. If you want to run a religious school with private religious rules, mm -hmm. we don't care what the religious rules are, then you need to take the school private. If you want to run a public school, then you cannot impose religious rules. That's true. That's absolutely true. And here's the other um, issue I'd like to bring out, too. Um, we're not the only people who, who are talking about uh, Yeshiva University imposing religious uh, lifestyle on its students uh, without alerting us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we know what we're signing on to. There was a woman named, uh, there is a woman named Diane Persky. She's a conservative Jewish woman. Uh, she worked at the uh, girls' college, and in 1999, um, she won, or she ultimately she won. She sued them um, for discrimination based on religion, and she was told as a uh, conservative Jewish woman that she wasn't orthodox enough, and she mm -hmm. lost her career. Um, so the school has already been found to discriminate on the basis of religion against a conservative Jewish woman. 
So when I called her up and talked to her, and she was she was laughing. She's like, Lydia, you know, they're not non-denominational. They're not non-sectarian. They're an Orthodox Jewish school. And if they were just honest about it and took the school private, nobody would have the problem. They want to sit on two seats. They want the public money, and they want to be able to impose an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle and, uh, and an Orthodox Jewish agenda. And that's where they get into problems. Let's see if you have any more people who want to call in. Yeah, um, we're at 212. 245-7273, that's 212-245-7273, uh, am I getting the number right? Yeah, and I suggest any of you out there who have an empathy to what Lydia is saying about her struggle, uh, call and give her some feedback, uh, make any suggestions that you may know out there in the world of television land on how she can win in this game of life that she's dealing with. Um, you can also email us at crookeddoctors at yahoo.com. So if, you, if um, cause we're due to go off the air in about 20 minutes, but if um, you don't get a chance to, um, to call in, you can email us. And um, one of the things, let me go back to the, so you've got us at crookeddoctors at yahoo.com and I will respond to your emails. Um, you can look at our, our, um, our YouTube videos where I discuss some litigation points. And um, let me go back to our live call-in. Um, you know what I should do? I should give a little plug to the Nassau County Civic Association because they're, um, well, let me uh, bring them up. Uh, let me go to the Nassau County Civic Association. I always like to give them, uh, oh, here we are at, um, let me give a little plug to the people who are helping us. Uh, here we are at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And uh, you can also, let me just increase the magnification here a little bit. We're at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. That's where we broadcast from. And if you want to watch us live, stream, whoops, let me take this off. Uh, we're at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And if you want to watch us streaming live on, um, this is, I'm on uh, channel 34, but you can click on Watch MNN Live. And we have live streaming uh, video on the internet. So you can hit the play button and you can watch us. So if you're not in Manhattan, you can always get us um, on the internet we stream we stream live um so if you're near a computer you can always see us also lydia have you spoke to mike philstein at manhattan times no but i'd like to okay I'll, i can introduce you to him now ladies wait and wait wait let me just give one uh, that would be terrific and uh, let me give one big plug to uh wait wait, wait. you have a wonderful story lydia uh yeah <laughs> um just one second, let me, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Sorry about the little technical glitch here. Here we go. Ah, here we go. The uh, this is the Nassau County Civic Association, and I just wanted to say thank you to them. Um, I got a question, so I wanted to answer the question. Okay, that'll be good, but thank you to me because I have a meeting. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me go Ladies back. Ladies and gentlemen, me, thank you uh, for allowing me to be here with Lydia this evening. Hopefully, I'll see you again. Uh, listen to what she's saying, and, and whatever you can do to support her and help her, win in this battle do it thank you very I'll much you talk to you later thank you so much for coming no problem uh, I, I know that um mr uh, mr james has to go to a meeting so thank yeah. you so as you're walking out thank you very much um as as you're walking out um i'm going to go to uh i'm going to go to the nasa county civic association and and thank you so much i appreciate it thanks so this is the Nassau County Civic Association. They've been very supportive. And I got a question um, about why they were involved. And I'd like to answer that question. Um, uh, one of the people who pressed false criminal charges against me is a guy named John Scarfone. He's Associate General Counsel at Yeshiva University. And he lives in Nassau County. So the Nassau County Civic Association said, nah, I don't think so. We don't cotton to a... Um, an attorney who gets paid by a, a major university to lie. And since this is the evil in our neighborhood out here in Nassau County, we're going to help Miss Raiden. And what they helped me, so uh, this is the Nassau County Civic Association. Uh, they are a conservative group. Uh, you don't have to agree with them on e every issue. In fact, on uh, some issues I disagree. This is their website. They got a whole bunch of issues here. Um, that you can uh, you can agree or disagree with them, but what they don't what they don't like and what they don't cotton to and what they don't support is when um, 
a major university like Yeshiva University pays Associate General Counsel John Scarfone, who lives in Nassau County, uh, to press false criminal charges in Manhattan. So when I reached out to the Nassau County Civic Association, they had had experience with crime and corruption. This is their website. These are their meetings, uh, some of the issues that they're involved in. Um, I don't always agree with the Nassau County Civic Association um, on how they feel about um, all their issues. But what they were very supportive on is we here in Nassau County uh, will not um, sanction, endure, sit idly by while, while um, we have crime and corruption in our neighborhood. So Mr. James and I were talking about crime and corruption in Washington Heights in Harlem at the 34th Precinct with Detective Cologne here in Manhattan with District Attorney Vance. And we talked about um, reaching out to community leaders like Reverend Sharpton and City Councilman Robert Jackson and my City Councilman, Councilman Rodriguez. Um, but in Nassau County, they don't cotton to crime and corruption either. So the Nassau County Civic Association, when they um, heard about my story, not only were they outraged, but John Scarfone lives in Nassau County. And um, so they were very supportive. Uh, they are a conservative group, but their feeling is our tax dollars should not be spent on um, illegal, on persecuting an innocent person who's asking for her records. Um, uh, the, the, I talked to, you know, it's interesting because I talked to I informally and, and um, uh, you know, off the record and, and extremely informally, I talked uh, to a member of uh, a teacher's uh, union and we guesstimate the cost to the taxpayers for my illegal uh, incarceration. Uh, it costs about seven fifty to $70,000 a year to keep someone at Rikers Island for a year. And probably the cost to the taxpayers to the city will be about a quarter of a million dollars if you figure out how much it costs them to, uh, to prosecute me and then to, I'm going to uh, obviously appeal my case. Um, and then the $70,000 a year that it costs to keep me at Rikers, probably the taxpayers wasted about a quarter of a million dollars as a rough guesstimate. So these are your tax dollars. And when I mentioned this to a member of the Teachers Association, she said, you know, um, the city could have paid for four good teachers, four good teachers, f instead of doing Yeshiva University's dirty work, instead of persecuting you for asking for your records and the ability to act, fully access and correct them. Um, the city could have um, not wasted, this is fraud, abuse, and waste. Um, and that's another reason why the Nassau County Civic Association got involved, because uh, they're concerned, especially now, uh, with the budget cuts that our tax dollars are, are spent appropriately and not wasted. Um, so, you know, it's a quarter of a million here and a quarter of a million there. And before you know it, you know, you could have paid for a lot of teachers. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the Nassau County Civic Association. And um, I wanted to thank them. Um, we've got about, uh, let's see, about 15 minutes left in our show, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how um, John Scarfone lived in Nassau County. He claimed, he, he, um, he made false criminal charges against me. Uh, he claimed that I committed a crime in Nassau County. That's not true. He claimed that I showed up at his house harassing him. That's not true. Um, However, if there was a cr uh, crime in Nassau County, I should have been prosecuted in Nassau County. The fact that the Nassau County District Attorney's Office would have nothing to do with this speaks for itself. But I never harassed John Scarfone. John Scarfone is Associate General Counsel at Yeshiva University, and as I talked about in my last program, he went into court in 2006 and he lied about me. And it's very simple um, that why. Uh, he said that uh, I was named as a witness in another student's case when I was uh, suing the school in federal court, which is separate than my criminal court action. Um, he lied and said that I had failed all my classes as a first year student, and that's not true. Um, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office had hard evidence in its hands from 2009. I didn't go to trial until 2010, so for an entire year, 
the Manhattan District Attorney's Office had hard evidence in its hands to show that John Scarfone, a complaining witness against me, had a retaliatory motive. And uh, I'm going to go a little low tech right now. I made up a little timeline as I was thinking about this. I'm going to hold up my little poster. Um, but I made up a little timeline, and this will be a tutorial for my attorney too. But um, let me just position this a little bit. Here we go. Um, John Scarfone lied about me in 2006. This is not hard to understand. And false criminal charges were pressed against me in 2009. So 2006, John Scarfone went into federal court and lied. And then in 2009, pressed false criminal charges. And the purpose of the false criminal charges, John Scarfone does have a retaliatory motive. The purpose of the false criminal charges was to bully me, intimidate me, um, have me sign a contract wherein I would release Yeshiva University. Um, oh, uh, they wanted me to sign a contract uh, where I would agree never to see my records from Yeshiva University. So um, I did go a little low tech with my sign, but this is a timeline that I'm putting together for my attorneys. I hope you can see it and it's not too um, shiny. But in, and I'm going to go through the timeline a, a little bit. Let me just hold it. Um, in 2005, I got an erroneous ruling in the federal court, and I discussed that a little bit with um, Mr. Gilbert James, my guest, who unfortunately had to leave um, a little bit early. But I got an erroneous ruling in 2005, um, in, in May of 2005. In June of 2005, I discovered um, a falsified prom promissory note, falsified financial information that gave me newly discovered evidence. In, um, which would allow me to amend my federal complaint, and I'll show you those statutes in, in upcoming episodes. In 2005, um, I organized up the evidence, and through Congressman Wiener's office with other students, we went to the Bronx District Attorney's office. The Bronx District Attorney's office lied to Congressman Wiener's office, and I'm going to get into those details in the, um, the next show. They're very easy to understand. In 2006, John Scarfone lied about me in federal court in another student's case. So in 2006 is when John Scarfone lied, and in 2009 um, he pressed false criminal charges against me. So John Scarfone had a retaliatory motive. Um, uh, and what, what happened was he pressed false criminal charges against me. Um, the magnitude, I have to put this down for a minute. There were 11,198 counts against me. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office was used to bully me. And the plea bargain that I was presented with was, we know, uh, this is what the Manhattan District Attorney's Office said to me, uh, ultimately. Um, we're going to drop all the charges against you. This is 11,198 counts. We know you're not guilty of any criminal activity. We're going we're gonna to drop all the charges against you, Lydia, uh, down to a violation, which is basically like a parking ticket. We know all the other allegations and all the other stuff that we said about you is just nonsense. The only thing we want is for you, and this is the Manhattan District Attorney's Office negotiating on behalf of Yeshiva University. The only thing we want, Lydia, is for you to sign a contract where you promise never to see your records from Yeshiva University. Now, what's in those records they don't want me to see? I said, no, these are my records. I have the right to fully access and correct my records. And um, I have the right under federal law, uh, you know, I, I, a basic common sense. I have the right to fully access and correct my records. School policy is federal law. And the judge in, in my federal uh, court case um, is a guy named uh, Judge Robert P. Patterson, Jr. And he's a graduate of Columbia University's law school. I'm an honors graduate of Columbia University. Um, I got my... Um, Bachelor of Science degree there in 1994. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what is going through this judge's mind as he's sitting up on the bench thinking, yeah, you know, um, I'm an honors graduate of uh, Columbia University Law School, and if my law school made a one-time honest mistake in my records, um, I should not be able to fully access and correct them. I mean, the law is based on simple common sense. Judge Patterson in the uh, Southern District in the federal court, he didn't check his uh, common sense at the door when he came into work. Um, so, he, I mean, I can't imagine that a federal judge would be sitting up there on the bench saying, yeah, if my law school made a one-time honest mistake in my, in my records, I, as a former student of a law school, shouldn't be able to fully access and correct my records. Uh, nobody believes that. That's just nonsense. And when I went to Washington to discuss this issue with my elected officials, here's what some of the staffers said. Judge Patterson isn't writing this garbage, Lydia. Yeshiva University's attorneys are writing it for him, and he's just rubber stamping them. <laughs> so, because nobody, no judge would sit up there and say, "Yeah, uh, if if I'm a former I'm a former student of a, of a, a law school, and if I can't access, and if my law school made a uh, one-time honest mis uh, mistake in my records, I couldn't uh, fully access and correct them." So. Um, We've covered a lot of material here, and uh, let me just uh, go back for one second to... Uh, if you didn't get a chance to call us, you can email us, and uh, I'm going to follow up with, uh, with Gilbert, with Gilbert James. Um, we had talked about reaching out to community leaders and in this program, and uh, I'm going to... I'm going to reach out to them, and hopefully they will they will help me and ultimately help uh, other students at at uh, Yeshiva University and correct uh, these erroneous rulings. Um, what I'm most concerned about right now is uh, Judge Patterson's um, stubbornness in not um, in not correcting the false rulings that he made. And you know what? I could show that to you really quick before we we leave. Um, let me show you one thing very quickly. Just before I, s you know what? Uh, just before I sign out, there's um, something I wanted to show you. Uh, this is we got about three minutes left, and I wanted to show you this very, very quickly. Um, we were talking about this. This is Judge Patterson's ruling. This is from page. Whoops. This is from page 27 of Judge uh, Patterson's ruling, and what he says is, I want to do this really quickly before the program ends, here's what he said in May of 2005, um, that my complaint identifies no bulletin student guide or compendium that allows a former student to correct ACOM's records. This is the Albert Einstein College of Medicine's records. Um, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine used to be known as ACOM, and now they call themselves Einstein or Einstein Medical School. Um, because we're running out of time today, um, and again, if you have any, um, if you have any questions, you can always um, email us at. Uh, at uh, crookeddoctors at yahoo.com. Um, Judge Patterson um, is, is stubbornly refusing to correct the erroneous rulings that he made because Yeshiva University has an agenda and they want his erroneous rulings to stand so that they can be cited to in the future to hurt the next innocent student. And so what I'm doing and with community leaders um, like uh, Mr. Gilbert James and the Nassau County Civic Association and uh, lots of other people are trying to do is, um, is make sure that we set up protections so that no other student can be hurt like I was hurt. So for example, on the United States Air Force Academy campus, the pre-med advisor is educating her cadets and their families about how to independently archive their letters of recommendation and their performance evaluations so that never again can a medical school lie 
like Yeshiva University's medical school lied about me. Um, those cadets will, um, can protect their future. Um, what we'd also like is to have Judge Patterson in the federal court and what should happen, the proper corrective action that should happen is that he should correct his erroneous rulers, rulings so that they cannot be cited to in the future. Um, and the last thing that we want is to have um, a ruling stand that says, uh, you know, a former student can't access and correct the records. Uh, that, and there's a, there, there are other erroneous rulings that um, Judge Patterson made. And the proper corrective action that should be taken is that the record should be returned to Judge Patterson and he should correct his false fabricated rulings so that never again can they be cited to in the future to hurt the next innocent student. Well, we only have about uh, seven seconds left. This is Crooked Doctors. Thank you so much for tuning in. Send us an email, and we look forward to your calls in our next show.